All right, welcome back to Zeros, uh, which we formerly thought we'd rebrand to Home Runs last week after the market was just inexorably moving higher. But uh, today we're looking like uh, we might rebrand it back to Zeros again. So welcome, guys. It's good to be back. Thanks for having us. Good to be here. And uh, I like eight baggers as opposed to home runs, because if you're expecting anything less than 8x your long investments, um, you know, you're just... You're just minor league. Let's start off. Obviously, it's Tuesday. We're filming, and the market has been taken to the woodshed on Jay Powell's comments. Um, what do you think uh, we're staring down right now? Is this a policy error? What's going on? Everything's been a policy error <laughs> for like <laughs> over a decade. But um, which which policy error? Yeah, I mean, clearly with rates on Treasury, uh, you know, ten year rates ticking up. That's what's what seems to be driving this. You know, I wonder if it's you know really what the actual mechanism is. I mean, I wonder if it's the the value of bond collateral falling, and therefore equities have to be sold to balance it out. But then again, with target date funds, they wouldn't be doing that for you know, until the end of the month, I think. So um, anyway, yeah, Freddie, love your take. Yeah, look, I you know at some point last year, I I stopped trying to work out like why markets had had gone up and down. Um, you know, I, I think what is interesting and people are really focusing in on, it feels like this week, is the kind of Kathy Wood dynamic. Credit where credit's due. I mean, Kathy Wood got 2020 right in a way that very few others. I mean, I think she was getting weekly inflows of about a billion dollars, which last time I checked is more than almost anyone on the short side was running in entirety. I think what we're seeing here that's very interesting is a massive sell-off in these highly valued uh, growth stocks. And a lot of people are focusing in on the fact that many of those names are concentrated holdings of hers. What I think is really interesting about this is we have seen issues before where there have been runs on funds off the GameStop. There was a lot of thought about hedge fund crowding and net and gross exposures. We have seen previously where large, um, you know, really celebrated fund managers have come unstuck by making less liquid bets um, with significant concentration. I think many people here know Neil Woodford, who famously had to suspend withdrawals in the UK uh, when he couldn't meet redemptions. What we have here is a really interesting dynamic with Kathy Wood. So she's been extremely successful in identifying companies with, you know, really exciting growth uh, prospects. Um, some of them, I think, have more questionable foundation in science, but leaving that aside, she's also captured an enormous amount of retail sentiment. And so as we've had significant inflows, and I think across her funds now, she runs somewhere between 50 and $60 billion, you're seeing significant inflows to those funds. Up to a point, that is fine. When you own one, two, three, maybe even 5% of pretty liquid names, I don't think you run into real problems. What she's seeing in some of her largest holdings is concentrations in excess of 10, 15% in some of these names. That in and of itself presents issues, but I think what is pretty unique to her and something we've not necessarily seen before is the daily reporting phenomena. As an ETF, an, an active ETF, she has to report these holdings daily, which on the way up is great, and it's having some really profound effect on you know, one, three, five billion market cap stocks where she's putting small amounts of money to work and it's kind of the, the Kathy Wood effect. What you're seeing is several Kathy Wood funds all in one, two, three, five names. And as you report daily, it's gonna be very interesting to see what happens if there are outflows, how she's meeting them. Because traditionally what you would do is you would sell your largest holdings. So I think in that case, it might, in her case, it might be Tesla. And obviously if, you know, she has to sell a billion dollars of Tesla, that's not gonna have a huge impact on the market. Well, what that is gonna have an impact on is the less liquid holdings. So as people see the largest liquid holdings being liquidated, I think where most investors will focus their attention, specifically 
short sellers and more fundamental investors will be the names, whether it's a Twist Bioscience or, um, you know, or, or PACB, where there are large concentrated holdings in companies that I think a lot of fundamental investors feel are significantly overvalued because of this Kathy Wood dynamic. You know, she happens to have been the most successful person last year in terms of gathering assets. But um, I think there's a lot of people that are trailing behind and, and following names that um, that she's involved in. So I think the first derivative is obviously Kathy Wood, but I think there's this layer underneath of liquidity that may well disappear as she is potentially forced to sell some of these names. What's also interesting, though, is um, you know that interview that I did a few weeks ago with Mike Green. So the analogy that I use for people is when you when you go into a market to trade, right? Imagine you've walked into a Moroccan souk, right? You have to find somebody who's actually willing to transact with you. And so the way to model this is to imagine that you reach into a bag and you pull out a marble and there's black and white marbles in the bag. If you pull out a black marble, that represents a discretionary trader and you can actually get them to consider whether they want to trade with you based on any number of criteria, slightly higher price, um, fundamentals have changed, the company just reported earnings, etc. Right. So you reach in, you pull out a black marble, you have the capacity to execute a trade. If you reach in and you pull a white marble out, you don't have the capacity to trade. That's a passive player. There is no condition under which they are going to trade with you unless they have received a signal from their end investor that says, I have given you cash or I have asked for cash. Right? Those are the only reasons why a passive vehicle will trade with you. So as you increase the proportion of white marbles in the bag, as passive gains share, you raise the odds that every time you reach in to try to execute a trade, you can't do so. I can't stop thinking about it. Um, and every time we have discussions like these, I start thinking about passive. And if you look at those names, uh, Pacific Biosciences, Twist, um, Vanguard and BlackRock are each about 15% of the outstanding in those. And then you've got State Street and then you've got other <clears throat> holders in there that might be passive. I can't really tell. Um, but yeah, the the interesting dynamic, I mean, based on the way these indices work is as the market caps increase, the weightings in the indices generally increase. So your passive buyers have to more aggressively buy those. But you know, if if ARC has to liquidate or eventually has to start selling those down, and then you also have the momentum buyers leaving that, I mean, there's not necessarily going to be that much of a bid from passive because passive is, you know, the market caps and the weightings and the indices are going to be shrinking. So you might not really have this passive bid there to put much of a floor under it. So and, and look, also just, you know, full disclosure, I mean, at, at Muddy Waters, you know, we're both Freddie and I are, we're actually now, um, we have some option, um, we have some option positions that put us net short on ARC. So just full disclosure there. Speaking of SPACs today, they all, they are getting beaten up. Do you guys have any um, intel on or, or outlook on those under the current regime? I think when the market takes a shit, the shit gets flushed first, right? I mean, like, that's what's going to happen. I mean, are people going to sell Apple and, and Google and Amazon? Sure, sell-offs happen. But the first thing they're going to drop are the things they suspect the most. So we didn't see the bursting of the SPAC Jesus bubble yet? Oh, no. I think he was blaming uh, last night in a uh, Twitter exchange with Andrew Ross Sorkin. He was blaming the Churchill Capital Four uh, shit taking yesterday due to the deal for Lucid having leaked ahead of time. My response to that, which is actually something one of our sharp eyed analysts caught, was um, Churchill, which uh, we shorted Churchill Capital Three's multi plan SPAC back in the uh, fall. Uh, my response was, that the way Churchill, their marketing deck for Capital Four was, it shows their on um, their prior SPACs, the peak, uh, the peak IPO return, meaning post IPO. So the IPO price of the actual SPAC, that's the that, that's the uh, the denominator. And the numerator is the highest stock price that they ever got following or at, at any time following the IPO. Um, I mean, massively misleading. Like, I, I don't 
like, I don't even know how that's legal. I mean, we come from a highly regulated industry that has, you know, that really, you know, where the regulator cares about cherry picking or presenting your best ideas only, you know, and, and because they're worried that investors will extrapolate that, you know, these best ideas are emblematic of your overall performance. I mean, how in the fuck isn't taking the high, the top tick of a stock price, dividing it by the, the IPO price? How is that not like, like cherry picking, if not something more egregious? So that's something that I, I really wonder. But yeah, Michael Klein, I mean, he's also just a, just a fucking sign of the times. Nobody should know this guy's name, to be honest. But hopefully one day it'll be synonymous with with failure in SPACs. Do you guys have any perceptions on GameStop and the fallout there after we watched the uh, the testimony? I mean, listen, that that was last week's crisis. The market's been down for three days. I really want us to focus on this week's crisis and what we're going to do to pull ourselves out of this three-day nosedive, okay? Because two, three weeks ago, man, it's it's old news. It's old news. I was looking for a yes or no answer, Freddie. Chairwoman Waters, I appreciate the opportunity to address that. She's yes or no. We always felt comfortable with our liquidity and the additional capital that Robinhood raised. Please answer yes or no. We always I felt comfortable through my with our five minutes. I don't have time. I just need a yes or no answer. <laughs> yes or no. So uh, honestly, like talk, talking about the um, the hearings, Mostly, you know, I didn't watch all of them. I, I caught a lot of Griffins and, and didn't, uh, you know, caught, I think, the relevant bits of uh, Vlad Tenev. You know, Griffin did a pretty masterful job of answering poor questions with good answers that didn't really impugn guilt. Um, and, and often, you know, unfortunately, the politicians are just outmatched by people who know far, far more about their business. The execution quality that we can provide as measured in terms of price improvement is heavily related or correlated to the size of the order that we receive. So if I were to speculate- I, I didn't, don't, don't tell me that, it's a, that there are other factors involved and take us down another road. I'm asking you a clear question. Assuming same size of order. One comes in from Robin Hood, one comes in from Fidelity. So as, as I was trying to explain, because the Robin Hood order comes from a community, a community of traders who tend to trade in smaller size. That isn't my question, sir. You're evading my question by making up other questions. Let me repeat. Two identical orders come in. Same stock, same quantity. One's from Robin Hood, one's from Fidelity. What happens? The quality of the execution varies by the channel of the order. This is a commonly understood phenomena in economics. You don't think they understood uh, the market very well? <laughs> what, what? Well, I was, I was going to say, say that. With I think Representative the, Anthony Gonzalez understands the market very well. I would say but that is five minutes. You got five minutes, and, and, and you're right. You know, Ken Griffin can answer bad questions well and not answer good questions at all. Uh, right. And just filibuster for five minutes. Now, so that becomes the issue. Now, the exception is Vlad Tenev. That guy doesn't even uh, seem to understand his own business. I mean, let's talk about why Robinhood uh, restricted trades. I think your your explanation about uh, margin requirements uh, charged by your clearinghouse makes sense. Um, is your clear is your clearinghouse supervised by the Fed and the SEC? I, I believe in that. That's are, are, are the margin requirements charged by your clearinghouse in turn approved by the by federal regulators? Yes. yes. And uh, did, did federal regulators uh, approve the value risk charge that was imposed on Robinhood? I, I believe, Congressman, the value of risk charge is outlined in general terms in Dodd-Frank, um, but I'm not sure who approved the specific implementation of, of that formula. Holy fuck, there were glaring holes in his answers that people were like, 
picking him off on Twitter 20 minutes later being like, uh, no, Vlad, that's, that's actually factually incorrect. Read your own filings. I mean, what a shit show. And again, we, we've talked about it before. So emblematic of Silicon Valley taking an idea, running at 100 miles an hour, not really understanding the implications of doing that on a massive scale. Um, so that that for me was like the nice differentiator to actually have someone up there who, who understood, I think, a lot less about his own business than the politicians. There's another sign that maybe things are becoming right in the universe. Ebix, an oldie but goodie. Ebix, the auditor, uh, which is a not very big firm, I think it's uh, RCM, the 8K was filed uh, Friday after the close, as companies always do with, you know, great news. RCM resigned. Um, they cited transactions that they thought were suspicious. Oh, for fuck's sake, Carson. Oh, Dan, thought, you know what he did, man? I think he set that up to make himself look important. God almighty! When he, when he doesn't have the chess set, he does the, hey, Krista, can you phone me in the middle to make me look important? RCM cited uh, transactions that were suspicious and they couldn't get sufficient evidence of their authenticity. I think that's, that's my interpretation. Um, now, they did make a point of saying, other than that, there was no disagreement with the comment or with the, with the company's financials, which, you know, I kind of feel like is that, you know, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? But um, this is one, you know, it's down at, as, as of filming, it's about $24. So it's come down quite a bit uh, from its Friday close. But what's amazing about this, this is really like another wire card type situation. It was first called out almost 10 years ago by Copperfield Research in March of 2011. Copperfield issued a series of reports. Then Gotham or Gotham City Research, Dan Yu in 2013 with a series of reports. And that really got, the Gotham reports got a lot more into the possibilities of fraud and started talking about India. And, um, you know, if I understand the uh, the resignation letter correctly, uh, these transactions involved business in India. And then starting at the end of 2018 and throughout most of 2019, Viceroy Research also was publishing on eBix. I mean, the stock right now is at about the same price it was when Copperfield came out. It's still about 25% higher than it was at the beginning of September of last year when the dog shit really began ripping. So it's just one of these things where it's nice that there's finally some vindication. Oh, another crazy thing about this company several years ago, I mean, it was suffering from the trifecta of investigations. I had never seen this before. It had DOJ, SEC, and IRS, and it's still got up off the canvas and peaked at, I think, around $80 a share at, uh, at some point. So, you know, I, I don't know whether to laugh or cry, to be honest, when I look at Ebix, because it's this company has smelled so bad for so long. I found that much of the research was credible. We never did an extensive amount of work on it ourselves, but, um, but from what I could see, it was credible. So... It's good that I guess something is finally happening here to at least vindicate the short sellers. But I mean, fuck, when you look at this 10 year timeline, once again, um, it actually really sucks. Yeah. Question for me is, you know, who picks up the order? Is it EY India or Drew Bernstein? <laughs> well, Dan, you're friends with Drew. What do you think? I'm, I, my money's on Drew. Yeah, definitely. If you guys had written on it, he'd already be the auditor. Or it'd be up 3x like Nanox, you know? <laughs> so, Look, so much for the golden touch. I'm just saying, this, you know, this goes to show with Ebex, Ebex and, or anybody else, just stay alive. Just stay listed. Even you go to a dollar or two dollars or three dollars, you know, the frauds will have their opportunity to shoot up again on, you know, industry market news, whatever it is, 
or they get some bull in there. And that's the game they play, is just staying alive and listed. You'd think with an SEC investigation, DOJ, IRS, that, I mean, you are dead. You would think, what do you have to do to get this auditor to resign? You'd think that'd kill you. No, it's not going to. It doesn't look like anyway. Well, as a former uh, Republican nominee for Congress, Dan, do you think Ebix could have stayed along this alive this long if uh, we had not had a Republican administration for the past four years? Well, thanks for bringing up that nice stinging memory where, you know, uh, I have a lost year of my life. Do you get a trophy for it or? No, oh, no. But I, you know, do remind me to kick you in the balls the next time I see you so I can just, you know, repay the thing. It might be a while. I'm not yeah. worried. Yeah. <laughs> Ebix, uh, Ebix will still be around then. Hey, Carson, he's he's making progress. He's above ground this week, okay? He's uh, making progress. To, to answer your question, the golden age of fraud started before this Republican administration anyway. And I have my problems with Trump. You know that, and I've been vocal about it. But, you know, we can't say that the Obama administration cracked out on these guys or fraud or China or anything else. And I sure as a, I mean, like, really, the last administration to start putting executives in jail was, you know, Junior, George W. Um, and all he, you know, all he did wrong is kill like a middle, a million Middle Easterners. So he's got his own problems, but at least corporate fraud did have some tangible um, repercussions for executives. Um, now it doesn't anymore. It's a fine. You just pay a fine and move on. I mean, really, like fraud and abuse just seems to have gone from pretty common by the end of 2016 to just just fucking gonzo by the end of 2020. But yeah, to be fair, I don't know that you can lay that entirely at the feet of Jay Clayton or, um, you know, or the, the Trump administration. I mean, I, I kind of have this view that the level of indebtedness in society or maybe the corporate sector is inversely correlated to the level of honesty. I, I don't know if you even have to be dishonest anymore. I mean, now that we have SPACs, why lie about anything you've previously done when you can just optimistically forecast the future and people will line up around the block to help you do it? Like, Freddie, what do you think that bed behind you would be worth in a SPAC transaction? <laughs> Depends if you wash the sheets or not. Uh, but I would be happy to consider it, putting it in my SPAC, Wolf SPAC, which will be coming to you all soon. Right? That's a great name. A roll-up of frauds in a SPAC. And uh, once we go to market, we're going to short ourselves. Okay, and you know what, man? By the time by the time you get your like fifth back off, I want that shirtless photo, and I want you to show people that unlike Chamath, you are not skipping leg day. Don't you tell me to spack off? You spack off. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, let's bring in Sam uh, Carson. Why don't you intro him? Coming back to a theme that has dominated this year so far. GameStop and the memes, meme stocks and the short squeezes, I want to bring in Sam Pearson of IHS Market. IHS Market provides analytics on short selling, and he has a unique perspective. He's also appeared on Zeros before. Um, is a unique perspective on how the actual plumbing works and how stock is loaned and borrowed. And I think that's excellent time to have this conversation because I really want to try anyway to dispel some of these myths about, you know, illegal short selling and et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, around GameStop. So Sam, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks, Carson. Good to be, uh, good to be on with you. So the first thing is a lot, a lot has been made of the significant short interest relative to the float and people who presumably don't understand how this works have stated often that and it and it's unfortunately seems to be you know gaining acceptance that that's evidence of naked short selling which is illegal and naked short selling of course is selling a stock short when you don't actually have 
the borrow or at least to locate on the stock. Um, is that a correct interpretation? Does a short interest in excess of the float indicate that there was naked short selling? Uh, I think it's helpful to think about where that metric comes from, thinking about a percentage of shares outstanding or percentage of float being short. Um, the goal of that metric isn't to kind of count out a percentage of a total. It's to give an idea of what could happen quickly if it needed to. And so it's kind of more like days to cover, I think, than people realize in terms of what the construction of the field is. Um, and I think the easiest way to think about it is that each share outstanding is an actual thing that exists somewhere. And so if somebody wants to short that, um, they would have to borrow one of those shares outstanding from someone today, short sell it, and then they and the person they borrowed from are effectively out of the picture until one of side of that trade wants to unwind. And so the way that you can get to short interest greater than 100% of shares outstanding is incrementally every day all of those shares outstanding could be lent out. And so when you're thinking about the percentage of shares outstanding that are short, that's really a measure of what could theoretically be covered in a single day if it needed to be. And so the reason why I think you know, the other related fields like short percent of float are relevant or a metric that we publish that's the short as a percentage of the supply from the bank side, which is utilization, um, those are kind of moving from shares outstanding to what do we really think you could borrow to settle a short sale today? And so uh, as you kind of increment through cycles of turning over all of the shares outstanding and having them be short, uh, you're, you can do that up to the entire shares outstanding every day if there was a shareholder who was willing to buy all of those shares from a short seller and then turn around and make them all available the next day. So what you're saying is that the same share can be sold short multiple times because um, investor A or short seller borrows from long holder, sells short to long holder B, long holder B then lends that share out to another short seller who sells it short. So that's basically how you get this, this phenomenon, correct? Yeah, and I think it might be easier to think about it as all of the longs collectively as one shareholder and all of the shorts collectively as one short seller to kind of walk through how you get there. Uh, where if you, know, you imagine the single shareholder day one, they have 100% of shares outstanding and the short seller is short nothing. And every day they could short some small amount of shares. And if the shareholder was willing to buy those shares back and then make them available for borrow, then all of the shares outstanding are available every single day. And so then the only thing that couldn't happen is that the short interest could increase by more than all of the shares outstanding in a single day. But there's, there isn't something that, and I think, I think, so I think the challenge of this is a little bit this isn't the debate of short selling good or bad. And I think that if you kind of bring this debate into that setting where people are saying, do I like short selling, then explaining the mechanics are less effective. But it's, I, I think it's easy to kind of think about it in that simple example that you're just, there's nothing that consumes shares in that process if everybody who owns all of the shares outstanding is willing to make them available every day and nobody who had previously lent their shares recalls them. That brings actually an interesting topic up. Everyone has been extremely focused on the short sellers, the short interest as a percentage of float. And, you know, what you're also bringing in here is the other side of it, the people who lend stock. Um, really curious to see whether it's GameStop, AMC, other meme stocks or, um, you know, across the broader market, what you're actually seeing on the lender side and how that is impacting some of the, you know, some of the kind of either really squeezy stocks or the non-squeezy stocks and, and what you're seeing there. Yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, in a broad sense, it highlights the value of participating in securities lending for shareholders that they can generate these incremental returns. Um, GameStop was the most revenue generating security for securities lending globally in January, and January was the best month ever for lending U.S. equities. Um, and it narrowly edges out like, you know, a couple of other, you know, kind of event months uh, for that. Um, so it's certainly, I think, for participants in securities lending, 
you know, they're getting that return. And it's kind of like for executives who might complain about the shorts, it's kind of like, well, where did they get the shares? They got them from your investors who were happy to lend them. Um, and so it is contingent on the willingness of shareholders to lend uh, to get that supply. And I think as they think about trading dynamics around specials, there's kind of, I think, a bigger picture here of how securities lenders generate revenue by lending U.S. equities. Uh, in a Historically, and this is going back like pre-08, there was a lot more of the return would be generated by reinvesting the cash collateral. And so there was risk that was being taken reinvesting cash collateral and that kind of motive in at the same time, the broker dealers were under less balance sheet pressure. And so there was kind of this period of time where it made sense for both sides to get the balances up as high as they could be. And the borrow fees weren't insignificant, but there was kind of this other part of it that was going on where there was this significant part of the return was being generated. Post 08, there was much less desire to in generate an incremental return from generate, you know, from taking risk and reinvesting the cash. And so that kind of leads, leaves the hard to borrow names as being where the revenue can really be generated. And so it increased the level of focus on trading those hard to borrow names. Um, I think what's happened over the last year, uh, which is an, an additional part of it, is that if you think about how retail, like lending out of a retail box works, um, they're looking at that differently from a revenue perspective than say a bank, you know, an agency lending program at a bank where they're going to be, they have a certain amount of assets and the owner of that asset is expecting them to generate a return by lending it. If you're lending out of a margin box, whether as a retail broker or as a you know, prime broker, um, you're motivated to generate the largest return and to kind of sweep that box for opportunities to generate an incremental return. And nobody's gonna be saying to you, why didn't you lend this at 10 yesterday? You know, when you think you can lend it at 20 tomorrow, they're going to, you know, their trading strategy just looks different than it looks for, um, you know, a, a kind of the traditional um, lender of a particular block of assets where there's going to be a different expectation of how that'll be used. If, if I'm not incorrect, I think some of the change in thinking around that um, was, was as a result of what happened at AIG, correct? I, I think AIG were one of the biggest sec lenders on the street. We're looking for additional juice um, in terms of yield, and and that led to some massive unwinds across the street when AIG had to effectively like pull that program apart as the underlying collateral was invested in what turned out to be worthless, largely securities. Um, is that the main change that's happened, or have there been other factors that have changed the way that? banks or regulators deal with securities lending? So I think that's certainly part of it. And that was, I, I think that was really uh, a pretty stark kind of transition for lenders to, you know, to kind of think differently about their reinvestment portfolios. Last year was, I mean, anytime interest rates get cut will be a good time for reinvestment portfolios for whatever duration they have. So like last year, it was a really good thing for lenders of securities when interest rates got cut because if they had you know, 30, 60 days in their reinvestment portfolio, they're getting that higher rate for that period. So that was a big upswing for lenders against cash collateral last year. Um, but in general, that's not been, you know, it's, it's the desire to generate returns from that side has been pretty low. And so that's kind of where you get, I think, uh, you know, a sharper focus on trading the harder to borrow names as a means of generating the incremental return. All right. Well, Sam, really appreciate your uh, joining us to, to walk us through that. And uh, yeah, please keep coming back to zeros and sharing your insight. It's a, it's a very getting into the plumbing of the market. It's, I mean, it's, it's esoteric to almost all of us, but it's really key to understanding what stocks are doing. And particularly when you look at these meme stocks and understanding the squeezes. So, Appreciate it very much. Thanks, Carson. Appreciate you having me on.